Alright, yeah, welcome back to some more Magic Jewels. This week we're going to be taking a look at a subscriber deck submitted to us by Ezra, or the Overpositor, as he's also known in the subscriber tournament. So it is a red-white aggro deck that's using Dusk Till Dawn to its fullest extent, which is kind of interesting. So hopefully we get to see that in action. Um, before we get into the deck, if you do have a deck that you'd like to see me play in the future, or maybe some suggestions... Uh, for deck ideas, anything like that, be sure to leave it in the comments section below, or you can send me an email as well, that's also in the description. So, without further ado though, let's check out the deck, shall we? So, this is a red-white aggro deck, so we're hoping to kill our opponent as quickly as possible in a very creature-focused matchup. Now, the build-around card is Dusk Till Dawn. So, Dusk is 2 and 2 white, sorcery speed says destroy all creatures with power 3 or greater. So, as you can tell, Anything that's not indestructible, of course, actually has power 2 or less, um, which is pretty good. It means that our board wipe doesn't hit any of our creatures and allows the rest of them to stay on the board. So if our opponent goes really big or they use a lot of lords, maybe um, maybe they've got servos or thopters or something like that and they're using chief of the foundry, uh, not chief of the foundry, the other one. Yeah, that one that gives all the servos and thopters plus one plus one. If they ever get to power three or greater, I can just wipe the board clear, which is quite good. And then once it's in the graveyard, we can actually use Dawn as well. And Dawn, yet again, we're also making uh, good use of as well. So for three and two white, sorcery speed, it's got aftermath, which means we exile it from our graveyard to cast it. Return all creature cards with power two or less from your graveyard to your hand. So as many aggro players would tell you, um, you tend to lose as soon as you end up losing steam, which essentially means you've got no creatures on board, you've got no cards in hand. Well, Dawn allows you to take all of the creatures that have died up until that point and put them straight back into your hand, which includes absolutely every single creature other than the gods, um, which if the gods are going off the battlefield, it's probably because they're being ex exiled, so Dawn wouldn't hit them to begin with, but it probably wouldn't even if he could. So, let's go to the beginning of the deck anyway, because that is where it shines. It is a quite a low curve um, deck as well. We top out at four uh, with our gods. Five technically with the dawn, but that one's kind of, if our opponent's wiped our board too much and we've lost steam, we rebuild that way. Get a full handful of creatures, essentially. So, right at the very beginning, we've got Kithion, Hero of Akros. So, for one white, we have a 2-1 legendary creature says, at the end of combat, if Kithion, Hero of Akros, and at least two other creatures attack this combat, exile him and return him to the battlefield transformed under its owner's control. So, this is one of the creature planeswalkers. It is essentially just another expedition envoy, up until the point it becomes a planeswalker. But he does have some added bonuses of becoming a planeswalker. But also, um, it can be kept around on the board as well with his secondary ability. So, for two and a white, Kithion becomes indestructible until the end of the turn. So, you can force blocks from your opponent or they can force you into using mana which is not the ideal scenario but if you plan on flipping Gideon, uh, Kithion into Gideon and you know that you're going to lose some creatures in the um, in doing so then you can make him indestructible to make sure that he at least survives to flip into Gideon Battle Forged. So it's a three loyalty planeswalker. His plus two ability says uh, up to one target creature an opponent controls attacks Gideon Battle Forge during its controller's next turn, if able. So we can force our opponent to attack into our creatures. Now we do have a lot of first strikers and things like that. So we can actually usually trade off a creature here and there. Eroasis Champion will take down anything with four toughness essentially. Um, it will trade itself, but that is an option that we've got available to us. So we can tap up and do that if we want to. Another um, awesome ability is his plus one ability. It says, until the end of the turn, target creature gained indestructible until the end of the turn and untap that creature. So we can turn our Erosis Champion into indestructible creatures. Lone Riders. Essentially, anything we turn indestructible is a perfect blocker to keep Gideon safe. And finally, he's got a zero ability as well, like all Gideons before them. Until the end of the turn, Gideon Battleforge becomes a 4-4 human soldier creature with indestructible that is still a planeswalker and all damage that is dealt to him is prevented so we get to go in for four damage here and there whenever opponent maybe is completely tapped out and ready to go so if we don't have any of these plus two uh, plus abilities to use then we can go and attack in and swing in there maybe force a trade or two next we've got expedition envoy essentially the non-legendary kithions 
though it's just a simple high value one mana two one essentially it speaks for itself next we've got selfless spirit so for one and a white we have a two one flying creature uh, this is for board wipes and removal for our opponent because as I mentioned an aggro deck that has all of its creatures removed is likely to lose so selfless spirit allows us to keep them on the board with her ability sacrifice selfless spirit creatures you control gain indestructible until the end of the turn so if our opponent goes for a planar outburst to save themselves we can sack a selfless spirit in response if they've got burn or just general removal for some of our creatures yet again we sack it in response and that just allows us to keep our board state um, when we might end up just losing because one thing that most decks do to survive aggro is just survive long enough to get to a board wipe use it and then usually you've stabilized but selfless spirit um, stops you from doing that on occasion as well which is kind of good next we've got lone rider so for one and a white a one one first striking lifelink creature at the beginning of the end step if you gain three or more life this turn you get to transform lone rider so on his own he just deals one um, damage gains one life but we can use things like invigorating rampage to give him a nice little pump which allows him to gain that three life and transform as well. So what does he transform into? It that rides as one. Really super awesome, great value creature here. So it is a 4-4 four, four, first striking trample and life linking creature. So we straight up go through most of our opponent's stuff. 4-4s four, and life link are some things that most decks cannot deal with. So it is kind of a game winner if you can flip it. Depends on what your opponent's doing really. Next we've got Kari Zev, Skyship Raider. So for one and a red, we got a 1-3 First Strike and Menace. It is a legendary creature, so we can only have one on the field at a time. However, when Kari Zev attacks, you get to create a 2-1 legendary monkey named Ragavan that is tapped and attacking, and then that gets exiled on your end step. So she actually attacks for three, even though she is a 1-3 First Strike and Menace. The first strike allows her to take off little servos and thopters and things like that and the menace means that she needs to be blocked by more than one creature. So she makes really, really difficult blocks essentially for your opponent. And she's also really good as a defensive creature as well. Um, she'll stop most things with the three toughness and the first strike as well can take down a lot of stuff as well. She's really cool for that kind of thing. Next we've got Harsh Mentor, so for one and a red we've got a 2-2 creature. I'm not entirely sure about him, but I'm sure he'll get some use out at some point during the videos. But his ability and the main reason you play him is that whenever an opponent activates an, uh, the ability of an artifact creature or land on the battlefield, if it's not a mana ability, Harsh Mentor deals 2 damage to that player. So things like Sacking Clues will deal 2 damage to your opponent. Um, any ability that our opponent's creatures may have will deal 2 damage to them to use it. Um, any mana abilities, so Guy Reach Sanitarium, things like that. Anything that's not a mana ability on a land, maybe turning a land into a creature to block, that will also deal 2 damage to our opponent. So Ash Mentor does have a few targets. I'm not entirely sure about, um, about him at the moment. I've not seen him played too often, so I imagine he's not going to get too much value in. But he's just a solid 2-2 two, two for 2 anyway. Uh, the worst case scenario so it's not too bad we then have battlefield scavenger so for one and a red we have a 2-2 two -two jackal rogue whenever you exert uh, whenever you attack you may exert the scavenger as it attacks which essentially means that it doesn't untap during its untap step which is a bad thing however it does have an upside whenever you do exert a creature then you may discard a card if you do draw a card. So these actually stack as well. So he, he discards and draws a card by himself, which means we can discard things like Fiery Temper um, and use the Madness cost on that to maybe clear the way. But if we have two of them, then we get to discard and draw twice off of a single exert. So there's kind of a nice little stack there. Um, not too sure about him, but he gets us out of uh, Mana Screws and things like that. And also there are Madness cards. So he does have a little bit of burn value there as well. So he's not too bad. Next we've got Pathmaker Initiate. So this is one of the build around cards that makes the deck work a little bit in the later game. So usually our opponent might have some big creatures and of course we're running two power or less on purpose for a lot of our creatures. So um, later down the line most of our creatures might not actually kill things. So Pathmaker Initiate allows us to get in with that final little bit of damage later down the line. So it is a 2-1 by itself, however you can tap it and target creature with power 2 or less cannot be blocked this turn. The best target for that 
is either the Hanweir Garrison, because when it attacks you get to create two um, human creature tokens, which might force our opponent into chump blocking some tokens, or even the Erosis Champion, which is actually four damage. So we can actually, in some cases, deal four damage by making the Champion unblockable, which is pretty sweet. And then after it's unblockable, we can give it Invigorating Rampage for that last little bit of damage. So if we go to Invigorating Rampage, actually, Speak of the Devil. So for one and a red instant speed, we get to choose one of the two options. The first option, we allow our target creature to get plus four, plus O, oh, and trample until the end of the turn. So we get to run over our opponent, opponent's creatures with one single one. So maybe we go on an Erosis Champion and make it a 6-2 double strike, dealing 12 damage if our opponent doesn't block it. Or we maybe even do it on two creatures instead. Halve that four damage over the two creatures, so each one gets plus two, plus oh, and trample instead, which might be able to push through a fair bit of damage as well. So Invigorating Rampage is one of our combat tricks that can either be used to win the game entirely or uh, just take out our opponent's creatures in the early game. It's pretty sweet. We then have Bygone Bishop, so for two and a white, we have a two, three flyer. So as I mentioned, aggro decks really struggle with um, using up all the cards really quickly. And Bygone Bishop allows us to get some of that back. So whenever you cast a creature spell with converted mana cost 3 or less, you get to investigate. So creatures 3 or less is pretty much all of them except for our gods. Um, everything else will trigger the Bygone Bishop. And when that does, we get ourselves a clue token. And a clue token is a artifact that says pay 2, sacrifice it and draw a card. So when we're running out of steam, we can use Bygone Bishop and all of the creatures that we play after it to generate clues, to generate cards, to hopefully keep maintaining that pressure on our opponent and finishing off the game. Next we've got Chandra, Fire of Kaladesh. So for one and two red, we have a two-two legendary creature planeswalker again. So whenever you cast a red spell, you get to untap Chandra. And she also has another ability as well that says tap. Chandra deals one damage to target player. If that player has been dealt three or more damage this turn, Exile her and return her to the battlefield, transformed under her owner's control. So, Chandra has to deal three damage, um, or two damage at the very least, and then tap in order to become a planeswalker. So, if you remember our uh, where are we going, our Pathmarker initiates, we can make Chandra unblockable for free, so we can get in for that two damage, and then all we need is a single red spell to untap her, tap her again, and then we can turn her into Chandra the Roaring Flame. So for four loyalty, we get a plus one. It says Chandra deals two damage to target player. It's pretty good. It allows us to get that last little bit of life off of our opponent. The minus two is the way that she protects herself and protects us as well. Chandra deals two damage to target creature. It's not too bad. It hits a lot of things, to be honest. There are a fair few higher toughness creatures, though, that that won't touch, so... Uh, mostly we want to be using her plus one because we want to try and get to that ultimate if we can. So for minus seven, Chandra deals six damage to each opponent and each player who has dealt damage this way gets an emblem and it says at the beginning of your upkeep this emblem deals three damage to you. So nine damage total with the minus seven is usually going to be enough to finish out the game and if it's not every single upkeep they lose three life which is essentially a lightning bolt or a fiery temper at their face for free which is awesome. So if we can get a flipped that is pretty awesome we mentioned the Hanway garrison but there is more to this card it is a kind of an interesting and annoying card if you can't get rid of it so for two and a red we have a two three creature whenever Hanway garrison attacks you get to put two one one red human creature tokens onto the battlefield tapped and attacking so it essentially attacks for four through three different creatures which is pretty sweet and those tokens don't go anywhere as well so if our opponent doesn't block anything then we just essentially build our board slowly and steadily. And those tokens aren't getting hit by Dust Till Dawn either, so that also sticks around. However, he does have a nice little synergy. He melds with the Handwear Battlements. And we'll get to the Handwear Battlements in a bit, but if we do manage to meld, we get to make Handwear the Writhing Township. So this is a 7-4 legendary creature, Eldrazi Ooze. So 7-4 with Trample and Haste. And whenever the Writhing Township attacks, you get 3-2 colorless Eldrazi tokens instead of two one ones so yeah it's a strict upgrade once you've managed to meld it um, there's a good chance that it probably dies but it's attacking for a fair amount 13 on its own um, with the two tokens that it also creates as well and the trample as well with our seven four means that it's probably going to get some damage through so Hanway the Rising Township although I've only ever melded it once 
it is really awesome when you can pull it off. Eroas' champion is next. This is an absolute boss of a card. So for one, a red and a white, we have a 2-2 creature with double strike. Pretty much speaks for itself. It gets to deal first strike damage and then regular combat damage after that. So four damage total on the champion. As we mentioned, we can make it unblockable with the initiate, which means that's actually four damage per turn. And if we manage to do that, we can invigorate and rampage after, give it plus four plus oh and make it go in for 12 instead of 4, which is awesome. The more pump spells we can put on the Erosis Champion, the better. Next, we've got Fiery Temper. So, we've briefly touched upon this. So, for 1 and 2 red, instant speed. Fiery Temper deals 3 damage to target creature or player. Pretty much self-explanatory. It is a nice little burn spell. However, it does have a madness cost. So, for 1 red... If we discard this card, we can cast it for that instead of three. So we get a nice little cost reduction, turning it essentially into a lightning bolt. And there are ways we can discard it. Not too many ways, of course, but Battlefield Scavenger is the, the main way to do that if we end up going that route. But having them there is quite nice as well. Next, we've got Kerry Zev's Expertise. So for one and two red, Sorcery Speed. Gain control of target creature or vehicle until the end of the turn. Untap it, it gains haste until the turn. At the end of the turn. You may cast a card with converted mana cost 2 or less from your hand without paying its mana cost. So if our opponent has a single blocker in the way and that's all we need to clear it out, Carry Zev's Expertise will steal that creature from them and hit them with it. If they've just made their Ulamog for example, then we steal their Ulamog, hit them for 10 and we also get to cast a card with converted mana cost 2 or less as well, which is anything from this, this way back. So Rampages, Initiates, Scavengers, Harsh Mentors, Carry Zev's, even selfless spirits to make sure that when we attack it's actually indestructible, that kind of thing. Hits absolutely tons of things on that secondary ability, so we can actually, it's, it's kind of like a 5 mana ability for 3, essentially. Next we've got Oketra the True, so for 3 and a white, a legendary creature god. It is a 3-6 double striking indestructible creature, and its downside is that it cannot attack or block unless you control 3 or other three other creatures so we need four total creatures in order for a Ketra to be able to attack or block but if she can then she deals six damage on either the attack or the block which is awesome and there's no fear whatsoever of her dying in combat damage because she is indestructible of course so she is actually quite easy to enable as well because her secondary ability for three and a white allows us to create a 1-1 white warrior creature token with vigilance. So we get to widen our board but we also get to get to that sort of that four creature limit which allows her to get in for a lot of hits. And it's going to force a lot of chump blocks and a lot of trades with Oketra if we can manage to enable her which it's not too difficult to do as you, as you can see we've got a lot of cheap creatures as well so... Upon casting her, we might just have four creatures total, which is awesome. Next, we've got Hazaret the Fervent. So far, three and a red, a 5-4, indestructible with haste. Hazaret cannot attack or block unless you have one or fewer cards in hand. So as we mentioned, um, aggro decks tend to use all of their cards really quickly and be empty-handed in no time at all. Well, Hazaret benefits, benefits from that. So for four mana, we can get a 5-4 swinging in straight away um, as one of our final cards. Also, she gets to discard cards to make sure that we have one or fewer cards in hand. So for two and a red, discard a card. Hazaret deals two damage to each opponent. So if we're drawing lands, we can use them as two mana burns, um, two damage burn spells. If we have fiery tempers in hand, we can pay essentially four to deal five damage to our opponent by discarding the fiery temper using the madness cost. But that also comes along with the cost of discarding it as well. But for four mana, dealing five damage to our opponent is pretty sweet. So we've talked about Dusk Until Dawn, so we'll get on to the mana base. So the mana base is as follows. We've got eight plains and nine mountains. As you can see, we do skew a little bit more into red. However, we have a lot of white one drops as well. So it does benefit us to have an even ba a mana base. Um, I've added in an extra mountain though because we have a lot of double reds and I've been getting a lot of mana screw recently. So we're going to be playing around with that. We've got Needle Spires as well, enters the battlefield tapped, adds red or white to your mana pool, but it also has the added bonus of being able to become a creature, so we get to keep hitting our opponent even after a board wipe, which is awesome. So for two, a red and a white, Needle Spires becomes a 2-1 red and white elemental creature token, uh, creature, sorry, 
not a token, with double strike, and it is still a land, which means destroy non-land permanents, things like that, um, don't target it. So, Needle Spies is really awesome, gets to swing for four if our opponents wipe the board, which is awesome. Next we've got Clifftop Retreat, so Clifftop Retreat enters the, battle the battlefield tapped unless you control a like, mountain or a plains. We're running a lot of basics, so these two are going to allow the Clifftop Retreat to come into play untapped. We need as much dual um, mana as possible since we are running two colours and we want both colours on turn one and turn two if preferable, so having these kind of tapped lands is really important to us. Finally, as we mentioned, the Hanweir Battlements turns into the Writhing Township. Um, if you've got the both of these combined, but it does mean that we have to get to six mana in order to do that So by itself it just adds colorless to our mana pool But we can also pay a red and tap it to give a creature haste until the end of the turn So if we've got four mana essentially we can um, play the champion and Give it haste to maybe swing for four which our opponent won't see coming We can essentially turn any creature into a hasty creature if we've got the mana to do it the next ability though is how we um, meld the creature so for three and two red you tap it if you both own and control Hanweir battlements and a creature named Hanweir garrison you get to exile both of them and meld them into the writhing township so we need six total mana because we also need to tap the battlements itself but if we have both of those creatures in play we tap for six we get to have ourselves a writhing township untapped ready to go and ready to swing in this will probably kill your opponent with one shot which is pretty awesome that's essentially the deck though guys so if you did enjoy the look of it then be sure to check out the matches that should be following very shortly after this if you do have a deck you want me to play in a future subscriber series as well don't forget to send me it either via email or in the description below either is fine by me and there is also going to be an update coming out soon as well so be sure to check that out and don't forget to hit the little bell icon as well and it'll notify you when that video goes live do hope you enjoyed, and I will see you next time, guys. Bye-bye.